After b3, the Larsen opening is on the board. This is not that uncommon, so it has to be seen like what to play against this. So we play d5. It's best not to put a pawn in e5. Although you can, it's absolutely possible, but like bishop e2 will be targeting the pawn already. And there's a line that goes pretty much like this, you know, the bishop attacks the, the pawn. You don't want to defend the pawn with the pawn because then you're locking this dark square bishop in. You're going to defend with the knight, but then the knight attacks it. And the best move, I think, as far as I remember, would be something like this. And then queen e7. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a possible line. There's nothing particularly wrong, but I'll, I'd rather play first move d5. So let's restart, okay, b3, d5, this is the repertoire I suggest, bishop to b2, bishop f5, quickly develop this bishop, don't play this move, this e6 move, locking the bishop in, also because this bishop will be too powerful, bishop to f5 then, okay, and now our opponent will have to go on with moves, so okay, e3, the idea of developing the light square bishop, then uh, knight f3 and then castle, e6, Knight f3, c6. This is the structure you want to have. Also because our opponent is planning to play c4. So a move like c5 or knight c6 wouldn't be as good because c4 is coming and our opponent has the intention to take here. We want to have two pawns defending that pawn in d5. So let's look at two ideas here. More or less, let's say white plays c4, right? This is the, the, one of the main ideas. Okay, you play h6. You'll see why in a second. Okay, white has to develop the bishop. It cannot develop the bishop from this diagonal if you don't take the pawn and you don't want to take the pawn. So pawn doesn't take in c4. So let's see this move. Let's see g3 with the idea of developing the bishop in fianchetto where there's loads of white pawns and uh, uh, loads of black pawns and white can start, you know, uh, trading stuff and uh, try to make the bishop better. Knight f6, bishop g2, knight a6, this is how you develop this knight. The idea is very simple. Now slowly you you get to understand the reason uh, more deeply, the reason for the moves of the black player. Bishop f5 and a knight in a6 will create a cooperation over these weak squares on the light, squ the light squares. This is because this bishop is not going to develop this side. This is because we are not capturing in c4. So you try to understand as many patterns as possible. Castle is punished immediately with bishop to d3. Obviously, you might wonder, okay, what if what if white plays this move first? It seems to be making sense. But we are going to go through that. Maybe not in this video, but in the following one. So if you stick around, just like you've been sticking around with all my other repertoires, you will see that you can go all the way from uh, chapter 1 to chapter 20. So some repertoires are very long. This one is not going to be very long. Maybe Maybe a couple of videos or three or something. But let's discuss all the ideas. So here, if our opponent castles, you play uh, bishop d3 attacking the rook, rook e1, knight to b4, we're going for knight c2, knight a3, only way to stop it. Bishop goes all the way back to h7, safe, planning to play knight to d3, attacking the rook, we're trying to win the exchange and winning the bishop. That means that we are going to win material no matter what. So knight d3 is a very powerful move. So white plays knight e5, best move. Also defending the square d3 further and the knight is going to his natural square knight e5 so bishop d6 the idea is to take the knight so that we can infiltrate in d3 and win material d4 you see how eventually the patterns will all come round so what to do now d4 is a very natural move and it, it, let's say it was bound to happen anyway this is an excellent uh, and very annoying uh, development for the white player the white player got the bishop in fianchetto the other bishop in fianchetto there's nothing particularly wrong with white Although, white is not supposed to play like that because this is slightly better for black. And so when white plays b3 as a starting move, that, that is a weak opening at the end of the day. So now black plays h5. The idea is simple. We're just going to go up and try to dismantle the king side, try to swap stuff and eliminate the pieces that are there, the pawns that are there. Let's look at this move. When white takes the pawn in d5, Obviously, this will be. Let's let's make an example. This move, like c5 here, will be absolutely terrible. This bishop will never play anymore for the rest of the game. So you can play bishop c7. You don't you don't have to care about anything. You play bishop e7 as well. Both will, will do. Anyway, uh, pawn takes in d5, and you take with the e pawn. 
this is also because think about it the only the only open file that white player has is the c file and he's playing to play rook c1 it's the only play to develop the rooks so if you keep these pawns like this it's better if you instead if you're taking with the c pawn you'd be opening the file so it would be slightly worse rook e2 for white knight to e4 knight to c2 challenging a very strong knight knight takes and now queen takes doesn't work because obviously when you move the knight there's an attack on the queen so you can win material you can play knight g3 with an attack on on this rook it's, it's all up to you rook takes in c2 and your best move now would be queen to g5 the queen cannot be attacked not without serious repercussions like, like h4 would be bad because you, you just play queen to f6 and the queens are out of trouble, but the white player has compromised. There's no pawn structure. There's like more empty squares around him, around this king. Remember, this bishop cannot play. This rook cannot cannot reach a single open file. I mean, this is an open file, but it's completely solid. There's no way through. And, you know, what else is there to do? White can't move a thing that makes sense. What about queen to f3? Challenging maybe with our queen and, uh, you know, trying to... Remove the queen of the board and play the game normally. The best move is knight to g3. It's an absolutely beautiful move because after all the swaps and everything, you're going to have an attack on this rook. So yeah, our opponent will have to be very careful. So Okay, what if in this position white plays knight f3? Okay, queen to e7. And now, you may wonder why didn't we go to e7 straight away? Well, because there was a knight in e5. If we go to e7, now white can play any move he wants. But if you bo like the best move is queen g5 with the threats, you know, that you just want to play h4 and so on. If white plays this move and then go back to e7, and now the knight goes back to e5, this is not achieving the same position because now we, we used to have a queen in the 8, now it's in e7, so we want a, we want a developing move for free. So let's not assume that the knight will go back to e5, that would be stupid. <laughs> let's see, rook a to c1. Okay, g5, we are going for the attack. a3, g4. Attacking the knight. So let's say if the knight goes to h4, you play queen to e6. And now the white knight is trapped. Right? So what we're going to do is... Well, he can't move anywhere, right? So we're going to play bishop e7. This is the plan. And then take this one and open this everything. And that's it. Our opponent's got no options. After that, it's going to get easier and easier. These rooks are going to come here on the open fire. You can even castle longer. You can play king e7. Play the rook to g8. It's fantastic position. You might argue, okay, what if... Our opponent plays f3. So f3 is to, you know, take maybe, or maybe get taken. Well, guess what? Surprise, we take. Knight takes back. The knight is no longer trapped. It seems to be going to a nice, better square. Our opponent doesn't seem to be losing here. But why is the position minus 4? Because now black plays h4. And we are going to inevitably attack. See how much attack we have over g3. Reducing the number of pawns in front of the king. And bring in the rooks. Our opponent has no infiltration because our center is very solid. What if the knight takes the pawn? Long castle. Oh, and don't be afraid of this crazy sacrifice. Rook takes. Pawn takes. Rook takes. King to b7. And you're fine. It's position evaluated minus 5. Even though it looks like our opponent can maybe try something crazy. But like we're attacking the rook now. And yes, queen c2 might defend the rook. But remember, white gave up a rook. So we're just playing this endgame. We can play rook c8 now. Our opponent is going to lose in material. He is losing in material. So th there's nothing there. Even though... Just in case you were worrying about it. So in this position, after g4, we went through knight h4. Realized that that kind of closes the knight. It locks the knight. So let's see. Uh, let's look knight 92. This type of idea is to remove this very strong piece we have in the center. So long castle. Okay, b4. This, is, this was the idea with a3, b4, right? And now obviously the idea, now that we castled here, is to play b5, exploiting the pin, and smash everything. This looks really scary, but you just play king b8 and you don't worry. Okay, b5, take the pawn, believe it or not. Okay, knight to b3. This looks actually really nice for white. White has no intention not to swap pieces here, because that will make our life easy. Because if that happens, then bishop in e4 can f can attack the rook and the bishop. 
therefore forcing a swap of light square bishop and when the light square bishop is gone h4 h takes is gonna be a disaster for the white king so knight goes to b3 more sensible choice maybe going to c5 where it might become a thorn in the back black plays h4 that's it knight to c5 okay take take and now sacrifice it's now possible because our position is so much better pawn takes back means bishop takes rook right so what well, i mean what else would you want to do here if you don't take back and if you just move the rook or something black has won a crucial pawn so you can just remove the knight and you, you completely winning it this point in g3 was extremely important well, now you can play a pawn to g3 and just er, er, erase everything that white has in front of their king so let's go through take take because we basically now give away two minor pieces for a rook so queen takes back it looks like this is now playable but now you just take this pawn and the position for the white player is falling apart e4 let's try this trying to open up and make this bishop become very strong queen to f6 this will allow us to control this file meaning that now bishop h2 is a very strong threat because then the king moves and then whatever you remove the bishop there's going to be discovered check you can maybe attack this rook so after rook to f1 attacking the queen going to a light square this also doesn't work because bishop check king moves and now you just go to f4 covering the attack on the queen the king will move again and now bishop e3 and that's gonna be it our opponent will is forced to play this move but now g3 let's take it from the start so we can close this video and then we're gonna focus on different topics in the next chapter of this saga b3 d5 bishop b2 uh, bishop f5 e3 to develop that bishop try to see uh, try to get as many ideas as possible e6 knight f3 c6 so this is the center you want to build and you want to make sure your bishop is out of that center because this type of bishop the, the light square bishop is black in this type of openings where you're forced to play like you know this french uh, karakan type of moves like you know with the bones of light square this bishop tends to be a very weak piece so get it out as soon as possible let's look at this idea now instead of c4 now let's look at bishop e2 normal development with castling idea okay h6 one of the reasons for a6 is to always have a, sh a shelter for bishop h7 in case white will play something like knight h4 which is not possible now because the queen but you know it's a it's a typical move knight h4 to attack the bishop might come later on especially because we do want to play knight f6 at some point then that's the moment for the knight to, to attack the bishop and he will trap a bishop if we're forced to give away the bishop pair. so you play h6 so that the bishop can always go in h7 and be safe controlling a very strong diagonal so h6 castle knight e7 d3 why d3 because there's nothing else d4 punishes this bishop and although you might argue okay white's idea is to play c4 and then hope that we're so stupid to take in c4 so that they can take back and have a massive center and this bishop can become strong we're not gonna do it we're gonna look at d3 now because it's a move it's a type of idea we haven't seen and also most importantly d3 is one of the main moves here the reason being you want to play e4 but not now but you want to play knight d2 and then e4 this is the typical idea that you know arises for the this type of players the larson players or the catalan players even if they play g3 for example with the catalan setup you will still play knight d2 uh, d3 you know you have a and then e4 e okay knight g2 f6 knight bd2 bishop e7 and just just the usual development make sure you also check my video about the how to beat the catalan because it's it's quite relatable okay now e4 but before we look at e4 let's quickly mention what happens with the usual move knight e5 the idea is to play knight the knight in f3 protecting e5 as well also one of the ideas behind d3 is to allow this bishop to remain strong unlike before where d4 was kind of blocking it okay you take bishop takes back that's a mistake by the way bishop takes back castle 
And now knight f3 developing looks fine, but you just win a tempo here because knight to d7. Obviously, you would love to take this bishop, win the bishop pair just like that. So our opponent, let's assume, is going to go back to b2. Bishop to d6 now. Rook e1. And now e5 is a crucial move. e5 is crucial. Now we have enough attackers over that square. And this is now no longer a passive game for us. Black is just better. You see how this bishop is soon enough going to point at the opponent king. Your queen is also able to go somewhere. The knight can jump to two different squares. This is a much better place for black to be. Although the most accurate way to continue... If, if it was black to move again, now you will play queen e7. The idea is to play e4. Once you get a pawn... Okay, queen e7 is important because, you see, if you play e4 now, white can take. And if you take... Queen takes your bishop for free. Then you can take the knight, but then they take back and there's no achievement. It's actually not good. So you want to play queen e7 to protect the bishop and then play e4. e4 is important to have a pawn in e4 because after take, take... We have a pawn in e4, stopping the knight from being in f3. When the knight moves from f3, h2 becomes a danger, uh, vulnerable square. Queen h4, the bishop will be targeting as well. You know, so there's loads of ideas, even potential sacrifice. So let's go back and move here in this position. Why to move now? e4. What to do in this case? This is an annoying move. It has to be met with bishop to e6. You obviously don't want to, to take... Because then take back, there's an attack on this bishop, attack on the on the bishop, on the other bishop. So now what to do? It's not convenient for white to take us here because we take back, we got massive center. Let's look at d4, right? We were all waiting for this move. The idea of d4 is to take, take, and then after all the swaps, this bishop become very active, the queen as well, and the rook as well when the files will open. Okay, now here we take this pawn. This is very important. And after the knight takes back in e5, Queen to c7, finalizing the attack. We have now three attackers over this knight. That means we are forcing our opponent to take us instead of the other way around. What to do here? Let's make an example. If white plays bishop with one to release an attack on this pawn, that's bad because you will just take in e5. That's your best move. And then after take, 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 the bishops here, we're threatening this loose bishop. And so if the bishop takes us, then we can take back with the queen and we're protecting the pawn. Potentially we can play f5 as well. So that actually wins for black. So in this position, instead of bishop f1, what if knight to c4? Saving the knight. Also because, you see, now if knight takes in d7, you got an attack on h2 first. And then you can recapture the knight. It's a much better position for black and you're also winning... A very important pawn. Knight to c4. Here you can do this. By the way. It's all perfect. Uh, king moves. And now. Don't worry about the bishop being trapped. That's not going to happen. You just play queen to f4. The idea is to go to h4. And that's going to be checkmate very soon. Right. Just move here. Check. Um, yeah. And. And then you, you go on to the last rank. And you checkmate. So what if g3. Queen to f2. So obviously that doesn't work. So in this position, what if instead, okay, we tried 9c4 already, what if f4, this type of idea is the, the usual move they play to solidify the, the attack of this knight, the, 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 the defense of this knight. And if we take, they take back with the knight and the game is opening up. Now here we just play rook a to d8. And the idea is one and simple. Well, after, well, basically this d pawn is now no longer defending the knight. So after knight takes, take, 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 bishop here, the pawn is pinned. Because otherwise the rook will take the queen. So th that's, a, that's a compromising move. f4 is a very stupid move by white now. Okay, let, okay let's continue on this line though. Okay, f4, rook a d8. What if white plays rook, bishop f1? Just to make an example, right? Take this knight. That's it. You want a crucial pawn. Besides, after that, you can play c5. After capturing the knight, play c5. Uh, you know... Doubling down on this pawn is going to be game over. So bishop f1 is no good. What's let, What happens after queen to c1? Removing the queen from the dangerous file. c5. Going for the center. c3. Defending that more. f6. Getting rid of the knight. Okay, what about knight to g6? Attacking the rook. Rook f to e8. That's it. And that's it. I think we're going to close the line here. Position. This is white having played only top engine moves to survive in a faulty variation. 
Let's just see some idea here. Okay, the idea, the main idea here is, is to simply play bishop to f7 right now, attacking the knight. And if the knight moves, then you got double attack on f4 with the, you know, it comes with that, the tempo on the queen. Position evaluated minus 5. Because you, we also have an attack on h2, it's completely over. You might argue, uh, I mean, what if this now white plays f5? Well, okay, again, you do have an attack here, it's just completely over. The f pawn cannot really move. So what happens after this move, c4, with the idea of playing d5, is a very strong idea, but so that's what happens if white plays c4, for example, you just play bishop f7 and, the, it, and it does the job for you. Okay, in this position, what if white plays g3 and plays like this and says, you know what, let's, that's it, and maybe I'll play bishop f1, bishop g2, and I'm playing a fine game. Okay, and then knight to b6. The idea is to simply play pawn takes and then when when they take you back you play queen to d7 preparing the rook to go to, on an open file position evaluated as if black was almost up a piece white also has an isolated pawn so this is much better for black this leads us to the last recap so bishop b2 bishop f5 e3 e6 knight f3 c6 and now we're looking at the variation with bishop e2 h6 castling knight d7 d3 knight g to f6 knight to d2 bishop e7 and we let e4 happen so earlier we went through knight e5 right and all the ideas that happen next let's see up uh, after the usual e4 move our opponent is safely castled and uh, this is actually a fine move okay here we take Remember this, pawn takes back, knight takes, and now bishop takes in g7 is possible, but now rook to g8. Bishop takes in h6, we're down a pawn, but knight to c3 now. Attacking the queen, queen e1. Bishop to h3, capitalizing on this weak pawn, and that's going to do the job. g3, only move. Now we don't even take the exchange because the rook is still pin is, is still trapped anyway. Bishop c5 is the best move. Developing. Knight to c4. Allowing the queen to attack the knight and develop. Improving the position of this knight. Queen to f6. Attacking this bishop and defending the knight. Bishop to d2. Doubling the attack on the knight. Knight to e4. Bishop e3. Saving the bishop pair from this game. Bishop takes anyway, pawn takes back, and only now it makes sense to take the rook, queen takes back, b5 is the best move. And that's where we're closing the line. The knight will have to go, but where? I mean, no square no square makes sense. Also, let's, let's make an example, knight to d2. Right here you sacrifice the rook. Boom! It's an incredible move, rook g3. Pawn takes back, knight takes back. With an attack on the queen and on the bishop. What's our opponent going to do? Let's say queen to, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, g2, it leaves the rook unguarded. So what if instead the queen just goes to e1, saving herself? But remember, now you can still take this bishop. When you get taken back, then the rook is falling. 